Welcome Shalom. We are honored to be hosting the Yom HaShoah V'Hagivurah, the Holocaust Remembrance Commemoration for Martyrs, Holocaust Martyrs and Heroism Day. This day was selected because it marks the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp by American troops, the end of the first concentration camp established by the Nazi. We remember that in over 40,000 labor, death, and concentration camps, in ghettos, in forests, in cattle cars, and in their own homes, over six million Jews were murdered by the Nazis. In addition, today marks the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, when 750 young Jewish fighters, men and women, gave their lives to die with dignity, standing up to Nazi brutality, teaching us the most poignant lessons of the human spirit. Our commemoration this evening equally offers us lessons in humanity, that of the power of standing in the light of one another, of those ordinary heroes who risk their lives to save others. The Jewish heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, like Marek Edelman and Vlad Gamid and Zivia Lubetkin, emphasized again and again that true heroism was the sacrifice of the mothers and fathers in the ghetto, the challenges of struggling day in and day out against Nazi efforts of dehumanization. Historians refer to this as Amidah, or standing up, the full spectrum of resistance and rescue as resistance. Tonight we pay tribute to the Schimmels and the Hugenbooms as rescuers of Leo Ullman, then aged four years old, and his family. They were named as righteous among the nations, and we are particularly honored that the Schimmels' grandson is lighting a candle tonight in their honor, and in honor of the six million Jews who died in the Holocaust. We pay, we pay honor as well to the courage of the Ullman and Loeb families, and to Leo Ullman's long commitment to the work of Holocaust Remembrance. He presently serves as chairman of the foundation for the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands National Holocaust Museum, which is opening in 2023. I want to particularly welcome Leo and Kay Ullman and thank them for a lifetime of dedication to the memory of the six million. We also acknowledge how important it is to remember the name of each victim and the meaningful listing of the 102,000 names of Jews deported from the Netherlands in the recent memorial, Zachar, Never Forget. I want to also take a minute to thank everyone who made an effort to come out this evening, um, to the students at Wagner College who are studying the topic of music and the Holocaust and the Holocaust generally. Um, I want to honor Ernie Bueller, who was born in Nuremberg, Germany, um, as a Holocaust survivor, and whose grandmother survived the Theresienstadt ghetto and concentration camp. I want to thank um, the, the Roth family, the son and family of, um, and grandchildren and daughter of Rachel Roth, whose family history is enshrined in our newly opened exhibit, and anybody who would like to come and take a tour of the exhibit. Um, after this event, I'm happy to give them a tour. Um, I also want to thank um, the president of Wagner College, who I'll introduce in a minute, um, the Reverend Paul Bishop Egensteiner, our trustee, um, a representative of the Lutheran Church of America. Um, the representative of Governor Kat Kathy Hochul is here. Um, our volunteers, Dan Glassman, who's running the IT, um, and everyone from, oh, and, and Sean, um, who's working uh, the, for photography, uh, Ruth Kupferberg, uh, Kristen and Caitlin, um, and my colleague Laura Morwitz, who has organized this event with me. Um, for us, the ongoing importance of this commemoration is clear. We must never forget how ordinary people can save lives through tolerance rather than intolerance by caring about each other in times when anti-Semitism and hate are on the rise and in all times. And I would like to now call the president of Wag... Music. Oh, the music first. Oh, okay. I would like to now call our cellist, oh, Laura, yes. Laura Morwitz, to introduce our cellist. Good evening and welcome. I won't keep you waiting too long. Uh, Laura Milnikoff is an accomplished 
An acclaimed cellist and recitalist, a native of Manhattan, Laura benefited from New York City's youth music programming, including the Special Music School and LaGuardia Arts High School. She's pleased to return to Wagner College, where she was a first place laureate of, laureate of Wagner College's Young Musicians competition, which we found out afterwards. Laura holds a Bachelor of Music from the Manus School of Music. Her master's degrees took her to Tel Aviv University, where she interned as a cellist in the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Her playing, described as a spiritual experience, has taken her to major stages such as Carnegie Hall, Alice Tully Hall, Music Hall of Williamsburg, Frankfurt Alta Appa, and Heichel Har Tabut Tel Aviv. She has been an enthusiastic orchestra member of the National Yiddish Theater Volks Volksbeine, performing reconstructed works of the heyday of Yiddish theater, as well as their recent staging of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Laura will be accompanied in, on the keyboard by Ala Milstein, an accomplished accompanist and recitalist in the New York area. And Laura will also speak a little bit and tell us a little bit about the piece that she's going to play. Thank you. I'm going to be performing Kol Nidre, a piece for cello, originally cello and orchestra, here arranged for cello and keyboard, by Max Bruch. Max Bruch was a German composer, and he completed the composition of Kol Nidre in 1880. It was at the request of a cellist, Robert Hausmann, and it celebrates Kol Nidre, the melody that opens the liturgy for Yom Kippur. And there's also a second <coughs> subject, which is taken from the music of Isaac Nathan, written for a piece after as it wept for the people who wept at the rivers of Babylon. And this piece is a celebrated member of the cello repertoire, and may it take you wherever you need to be taken.
Thank you so much for that really moving tribute. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the president of Wagner College, Angelo Aremo. Since the founding of the Holocaust Center eight years ago, and I remember that first conversation, and as a historian himself, President Aremo could not be more supportive of all the endeavors to deepen an understanding of the Holocaust among our students and in the community. He truly believes that the lessons of the Holocaust are a moral compass for 21st century education. He has had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Ullman and hearing about his story growing up in Nazi-occupied Holland. We know he has been looking forward to this event, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you, Lori. And, um, it's very hard to follow something that beautiful. But, um, I, first of all, you know, I, I'm so thrilled, and I know a number of you got to see it by the opening this semester of our, our new Holocaust Center. It, it really, you know, as Lori said, eight years ago, the idea sprung up, and, and I was looking while I was sitting there at this, and you know, 20 years ago, none of this existed. We didn't have a high society, and obviously we did not have a Holocaust Center, and the work that's been done by the society, and then by Lori, and, and later on also by Laura Morowitz, another one of our faculty members, and so many of you in this room who have helped to really create that center. It, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing that it's, that it's on this campus, that it's on a college campus, because it, it really makes it a living center. I walk by there probably, I don't know, two or three times a week, and there's usually a class going on there. And they're probably, often they're not history classes in general, or Holocaust <laughs> classes specifically, but I can't help really believing that the students in there are still experiencing that center right before class or after, um, maybe even during, and, and sparking in them hopefully, you know, a curiosity to make them learn more. Um, and that's really what the center is for, to keep alive teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Because, you know, it was less than six months ago we were here for our Kristallnacht commemoration <coughs> in the St. Louis. And we talked a little that night, um, I talked a little that night about the growing um, sort of anti-democratic movements across the world, including in our country at times, and, and just the, you know, how important it is to, to teach the Holocaust, to teach about the St. Louis and the refusal of, of welcoming refugees. And some of that might have seemed abstract, and even the talk about the, the, you know, the decline in a lot of places of democratic values, and, and the idea that you know, when democracy wanes, so does individual rights, and the ideas of free speech and freedom of religion and minority rights. And here we are less than six months later, and um, we see a very real example, unfortunately, going on in Europe, not very far from where much of the Holocaust took place, and there is a refugee crisis. And um, so it really brings home how important it is to continue to learn and, and to study history um, and, and really to, to continue to be vigilant about how important democracy and democratic values are to the principles that, that keep people free. Um, so I, I really appreciate you all being here tonight. and. Um, I'm very excited about our guest speaker. It was actually at that one, I think, that, that Leo became familiar with Wagner College. Um, and we've, we've been in touch since, and, and we're thrilled to have him here tonight. So again, thank you all for coming, and um, enjoy. very, very happy today um, to introduce uh, Council General Anamieke Rohuch, <laughs> um, who is head of mission at the Consulate General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. She has served as a diplomat in Moscow, Washington, D.C., the, Vil the Hague, Vilnius, and Kibera. We are extremely honored and fortunate that she is with us tonight. Um, and she is going to say a few words with us. Welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I always say my name 
like that I'm very unsuitable for foreign service. <laughs> and, and, and I'll say it once, in Dutch, no offense, in Dutch it's, spell, it's, it's pronounced Ruigrok. My name is Annemieke Ruigrok, Consul General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in New York. And it's a great honor to be here with you tonight. I've been asked to say a few words about the way um, the Holocaust is remembered in the Netherlands. Uh, foreign tourists who visit the Netherlands in the first week of May might be struck not only by flowers blossoming there in springtime, but they might also notice a somewhat somber atmosphere. On television there will be many films and doc 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 documentaries about the Second World War, and also in newspapers and other media there is a lot of attention for the plight of the Netherlands under German occupation. And this is in the lead up to May the 4th, which in the Netherlands is National Remembrance Day. Part and parcel of this commemorative effort in these days is the grieving for the Jewish community that the Netherlands lost. Before the Second World War, the Dutch Jewish community was thriving, consisting of about 140,000 men, women, and children. Over 100,000 of them were murdered in the Holocaust, which is around 70%. That is a big number, especially when compared to neighboring countries. And that leads to deep self-reflection. People point to the fact that the Netherlands is flat and small and that it is difficult to hide. But our civil registry was immaculate. So it was very easy for the Germans to find all the information that they needed to round up the Jewish inhabitants of the Netherlands. And although there were many civil servants in those days and resistance fighters, who saw the danger of that and who carried out activities to destroy local civil registries. There were also many civil servants who cooperated and provided the information asked for. There are, however, also stories of people saving lives and they keep inspiring us and especially when it is about saving the lives of children, like Mr. Ullmann in those days. One of the stories that stand out for me in this respect is the story about a nursery, a children's crash in the center of Amsterdam. When rounding up the Jewish population of Amsterdam, the Germans used the location of a then fam famous theater, the Hollandse Schouwburg the Dutch theater in translation. They used that as a holding area before transporting uh, the Jewish population to the extermination camps. And after that location reached capacity, they gave the order to organize a separate holding center for the smallest of the children across the street. And the teachers and nurses of that nursery Led by, led by Henriette Pimentel, saved the lives of hundreds of these children by smuggling them out of that building in any way imaginable. In many cases, right under the eyes of the, German, of the Germans at the other side of the street. They were spirited off in laundry baskets, in bicycle baskets, in any, any way you can imagine, out of Amsterdam, many of them taken to the Dutch countryside, where farmer families took them in and raised them as their own. They kept this up until the 23rd of July, 1943, when the Germans raided this nursery and sent all the remaining children and staff to their death in the extermination camps. Henriette Pimentel herself was murdered in Auschwitz 
in September 1943. Why am I telling this story? Because the courage of those people who saved lives at great personal risk gives hope and inspiration. But also because earlier today in Israel, in a ceremony at the Scroll of Fire monument, Henriette Pimentel was honored in the presence of the Dutch ambassador. We will not forget them. We should not forget them. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful remarks. We will now present the candle lighting ceremony, which has been pre-recorded in the Netherlands. Our first candle will be lit by Professor Emil Shriver, General Director and Founder of the Jewish Cultural Center, and Ms. Julie Mart Cohn, a second generation survivor and cousin of Mr. Ullman and curator of the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam. I'm uh, Emil Schrijver, General Director of the uh, Jewish Cultural Quarter in Amsterdam and as such of the National Holocaust Museum. And I'm lighting this candle in uh, commemoration of all those of the extended Ullmann family who did not survive the murder of the Second World War, of those who did survive but who are no longer among us, and in honor of those who are still among us, first and foremost, uh, Leo Ullmann. And I want to take this particular opportunity to uh, thank Leo Ullmann to express enormous gratitude for all the work that he's been doing for the Jewish Cultural Quarter and on behalf of the National Holocaust Museum in the course of many years. I wish him a long and healthy life until 120. And I'm particularly happy that we also have one of, our, one of my closest colleagues, our curator Julie Mark Cohen, was actually a member of this already mentioned uh, extended Ullmann family, Julie Mark. Uh, dear Leo, dear all, um, I'm very honored, uh, Leo, that you invited me to take part in this uh, very special commemoration. Leo and I are related through his mother, uh, who was uh, the younger sister of my grandmother. Um, and uh, Leo's parents, uh, they uh, went into hiding during the Second World War. Uh, my grandmother and her three children, uh, she, they were deported to uh, Bergen-Belsen and they all miraculously survived the war. Uh, in 1947, Leo's parents decided to, to leave Amsterdam and to settle in the United States and my grandparents decided to stay in Amsterdam. So I was born in Amsterdam, I've lived in Amsterdam all my life and um, I, I feel very, very much connected to the city and to its history, and in particular, uh, its war history. Um, I, I live uh, very near the old Jewish quarter, uh, with its uh, synagogues, which now houses, uh, which now house the, uh, the museum. And uh, when I go uh, to the museum on my bicycle, uh, three minutes right, um, uh, like this morning, um, I pass by quite a number of locations which uh, remind us of what happened during the Second World War. One of these locations is uh, the, uh, the Holocaust Name Monument, which was uh, designed by um, Liebeskind, Daniel Liebeskind, and uh, which was only quite recently opened. Um, uh, each, uh, each brick of each of the 102,000 bricks of this monument have a name uh, of a victim without a grave and um, there are about 180 um, of them that, um, that, uh, that are members of our family. So um, for me no day goes by without commemorating and remembering what happened during the Second World War and without remembering those who perished during the war. Um, although uh, as a result of the, uh, of the Second World War um, 
our families ended up in different continents. Um, we have always remained very close to each other, and not in the least thanks to you, Leo, and thanks to your parents. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank you for that very much for being there and for being so very good to the museum. And um, to conclude, I wish you all a very memorable commemoration. And also on my behalf and on behalf of the entire staff of the museum, we wish you a uh, wonderful event. Interesting, responding to Julie March's uh, remarks, I think that one important aspect of the work that we do and the work that and the mission that we share with uh, Leo Oman is the fact that we want to, people to be aware of the fact that the Holocaust did not happen to an, an unthinkable number of six million people, but the six million individual people. So we concentrate on the individual lives of the people. And Leo has been a wonderful example for many of us in continuing to tell his personal story. So I also wish you a memorable event and a wonderful continuation of your day. Thank you very much. I'd like to scandal, first of all, to commemorate the six million dead of World War II. But I also like it to remember and honor my grandparents who looked after Leo in Amsterdam for over two years to help him survive the war and give him a future. And I thank Leo for his continued effort to keep their memory alive even so many years after the war. Thank you for that candle lighting. I'll say a few words to introduce the history of the Holocaust in the Netherlands, um, and then Laura will come up and introduce Mr. Ullman. A month before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which we commemorate tonight, in a quiet corner in a home in the Netherlands, another form of resistance was taking shape. Anne-Marie Ullman Loeb, grandmother of our keynote speaker, wrote a letter to her children, Franz and Emily, in distress and with resolve, who were hiding in separate places in Amsterdam. Quote, what tragedy and sorrow among your friends and family, she said upon hearing of the latest razzia or roundup in Amsterdam. She shared that she was having dreams of walking in the park with her grandson, Leo, Quote, I cried when I woke up. The fear and danger of Nazi persecution that plagued Leo's family is at the heart of our program tonight. When the Nazis invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940, the, the Ullmans made up part of the 2% of the population that was Jewish, mostly Dutch born, but some also from Germany. By 1940, in September, all Jewish newspapers were banned, Jews were fired from the Dutch civil service, and a Jewish council was established. By the following summer of 1941, Leo's family were among the Jews no longer allowed in swimming pools, in public parks, restaurants, trains, or cinema, or even to ride bicycles. And in January of 42, the large-scale deportations of Dutch Jews to work camps began, and that summer to death camps. A central question in the history of the Holocaust is why did three quarters of Dutch Jews perish, the largest percent of any Western country, compared to less than half of Belgian Jews and only 25% of French, French Jews? Why were the Dutch Jews three times as likely to be arrested and deported than in France, although France has a reputation of anti-Semitism and intolerance? And why has so little been written about Holland and its Jews during the war in English, despite the dominant role of Anne Frank and her diary in Holocaust Remembrance? A partial answer comes from examining the particular Nazi administration in the Netherlands. The Netherlands had a civilian occupation rather than a military one, as in France and Belgium. Further, the former Chancellor of Austria, Arthur Seuss Inquart, um, who was warmly well, had warmly welcomed the Anschluss and was a member of the SS, was appointed Reichskommissar Governor in the Netherlands. In addition, Himmler appointed as another zealous anti-Semite, Hans Rauder, as Chief of the Dutch Police. 
According to the historians at Yad Vashem, the efficacy of these Austrian Nazis made it more dangerous to rescue Jews in Holland than in Belgium or France. 5,000 German police were stationed in the Netherlands compared to 3,000 in France. In Holland, those caught were likely to be executed or sent to a concentration camp. Informants were given a significant sum of money for every Jew caught with their help. This is one explanation of what happened to Anne Frank, leading to her family's deportation in August of 1944, while another explanation is that the police were investigating smuggling on the black market and fraud over ration coupons. These were more plausible explanations than the more recent 60 Minutes expose using the cold case team, which has since been refuted by four Dutch scholars. The danger of rescuing Jews in Holland makes tonight's event even more poignant. Our event this evening draws attention to heroism and rescue. We focus on the bravery and compassion of two non-Jewish families, as well as to the strategic planning and survival of the Ullman and Loeb families. The Netherlands has nearly 6,000 righteous Gentiles among the nation, those ordinary people who risk their lives to save others. It's the highest number in Western Europe and second only to Poland in the Holocaust. Overall, there are 28,000, so 6,000 is a large number. Yad Vashem, which offers this designation, has also conferred another honor to the Netherlands. It is home to one of only two cities in the Holocaust where all 700 residents were collectively honored for their courage in saving Jews. I will mention, in following on the words of the Consul General, just a few examples of men and women who resisted the Nazis. You want to pull up the slides. The Consul General had already, um, well, first I just want to point out the, um, we made a few references to the Holocaust name memorial, um, which has the most unusual architecture. Um, from above, it says the word Zohar, or remembrance. Um, and then each brick has the names. I'm sure Leo will tell us a little bit more about this project. Um, Henriette Pimentel, who's credited with rescuing 600 children, was a Sephardic Jew of Portuguese origin and a pioneer of child care, a teacher and a nurse, recently honored as, quote, a Jewish savior of the Jews by international B'nai B'rith. And you have heard her story, both the heartbreaking, um, the heartbreaking mission of separating children from their parents to rescue the children while the parents would be deported, and then the final arrest of Henriette, deported to Auschwitz along with 100 of these children. It is estimated that women made up a third of the half million Dutch in the resistance networks that helped 28,000 Dutch Jewish men, women, and children, like Leo, go into hiding. I will also mention Eddie Hillesum, a social worker who I've long admired. She left a position working in Amsterdam for the Jewish Council to help the first group of Jews which were transported to Westerbork, the detention camp from which they would then be sent to the death camps in July of 1942. Eddie left an invaluable diary on the hardships of the Dutch Jewish community. This is the closest we have to the Onik Shabbat archives of Warsaw for the Jews of the Netherlands. After the Dutch were required to wear the yellow star in March of 1942, she wrote, quote, in the years to come, children will be taught about yellow stars and terror at school, and it will make their hair stand on end. And at times she was blunt, as in the summer of 1942 when she wrote, what is at stake is our impending destruction and annihilation. We have no more illusions about that. They are out to destroy us completely. We must accept that and go on from there. And indeed she did with tremendous bravery, helping all of those who surrounded her in Westerbork until in September of 1943, she too was deported. And her final line in her diary, before turning it over to a friend, ends with words of empathy for our time. We should be willing to act as a bomb to all wounds. She was murdered in November of 1943 in Auschwitz. We are grateful to Leo Ullman and his family for sharing with us tonight the stories of heroism and to his extended family and himself and those of his non-Jewish rescuers before, during, and after the war. And I now turn to Laura Morwitz to introduce our keynote speaker.
thank you, Lori, for providing some of the background and pointing out some of the um, many heroes. In the 1940s, the director of a very prestigious institution liked to say, quote, Hitler shakes the trees and I collect the apples, end quote. Leo Ullman is indeed a golden apple. He was born in a place that four years later would be invaded by national socialists, hell-bent on making sure that no one like Leo would make it out alive. Indeed, of an estimated 160,000 Jews, both Dutch-born and refugees who had arrived to escape earlier Nazi invasions, less than 25% survived. But Leo did indeed survive and in the best possible form of revenge against the Nazis, has gone on to lead an extraordinary, accomplished, and generous life. Leo will detail the story of his hiding and his rescue by a group of heroic individuals. I will start mine where that story leaves off. At the age of eight, Leo arrived with his parents, Frank and Emily, in the United States, making their home in Port Washington. Speaking only Dutch, Leo quickly managed to master his new language of English, and while adjusting to the United States, became a stellar student. In the country for all of 10 years, Leo went on to study at and graduate from Harvard College. From there, he went on to study law and business at Columbia University. In what would become a profound commitment of his giving back, he also served in the US Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserves. He took his knowledge and experience and began to practice law for 35 years here and abroad, while simultaneously building a real estate ownership and management company that would lead him eventually to be awarded as Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young in 2005. Leo has also shared his story in a book that he wrote, 765 Days in Hiding, which exists also in a version for children so they too can know. But if Leo lived the American dream, he never forgot his connection and his roots in the Netherlands and his deep ties to both of the families who still live there, still lived there. His many aunts, uncles, and cousins, and his war family, the Schimmels, who had saved his life. To this day, as we will see a little, as we have seen in the candlelighting ceremony, these formative experiences continue to shape him as a person and to have allowed him to forge unbreakable bonds with the people who risked their lives to save his. Helping to support and contribute to the most important institutions in the US and overseas, dedicated to keeping alive the memory of the Holocaust in the Netherlands has been one of Leo's life missions. These places are stronger and more secure for his support of them. For two decades, Leo gave his time as director of the Anne Frank Center in New York and served as its chairman for seven years. In 2009, he and his wife Kay co-sponsored the traveling exhibition, State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, where he has also served on the development committee. Leo has also somehow, amidst a large family and an incredible career, managed to give his full support to institutions overseas. He has played a crucial role in what is now called the Jewish Quarter of Amsterdam, serving as the chairman of the foundation for the Jewish Historical Museum of Amsterdam. As the new and much anticipated National Holocaust Museum in the Netherlands is set to open its doors in Amsterdam, of course Leo has also played an important part there, serving on the foundation. If I added that while doing all of this, Leo is also a cello player and has acquired a fantastic collection of American social realist art. You might not believe me, so I will not go into detail about that. But I will tell you that when I mentioned to Leo my excitement about an artist in his collection, William Groper, he offered to donate the work, uh, a, a print by Groper of the 1968 uh, convention to Wagner and has indeed generously given it to us tonight where it can be seen uh, against the wall there. So thank you so much. We had the tremendous good fortune of making Leo's acquaintance when he took time out of his tremendously busy schedule to write a kind and thoughtful email about an earlier Wagner College Holocaust Center event on hiding in the Netherlands, which he had attended. 
In this email, he shared some details of his own remarkable story with us, compelling us to learn more about him and about his rescuers. As he has for people of all ages, Leah will tell us his story in just a few moments and impart to us the lessons it contains. His talk will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions, which will be moderated by his, by his oldest daughter, Laura Schwartz. It is now my great pleasure to welcome him and learn more about his story. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you all very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's a special honor uh, for me to um, acknowledge the presence of the Consul General, whose name I can pronounce, Annemieke Ruigrock. Um, and I am honored by her presence. Uh, I also uh, want to thank very much uh, the president of the Wagner College, uh, whom I have spoken to, and um, Mr. Uh, Oremo is a, is a wonderful leader for this very fine school. Um, my story started basically in 1932. It's a story of my father and mother. My father was born in Germany. Uh, in 1932, he graduated college, uh, I'm sorry, graduated high school, left Germany because there was not much opportunity there, came to Holland, uh, where he got a job in the largest department store, the Bayenkorf, the Beehive in Amsterdam. There he met my mother uh, through a cousin also working at the Bayenkorf. And my mother at that time, uh, was in her first year of the university, and she was a member of a sorority called Arctos. Arctos ultimately played a tremendous role in saving our lives. Um, a sorority in Holland isn't quite like a sorority in a U.S. university. Uh, it's a lifelong commitment, and those people are among the best friends that uh, the members of the sorority have for a lifetime. Uh, it's a lifetime commitment. And for us, it was indeed a life-saving commitment. My mother came from a very fine family. Um, and I will uh, ask for the first. I do have a PowerPoint. This is where my mother uh, lived. Her family was involved in the diamond cutting business. My grandfather and his brother had a very fine business. Uh, my mother grew up with maids, with chauffeurs. Uh, they were well-to-do, um, and they lived a wonderful life. Uh, they were fully assimilated in Dutch society. They were not separated as Jewish, uh, though they were Jewish. Um, they were fully uh, assimilated and never knew that they were different. Um, after my um, parents uh, married in 1936, my father was sent uh, to the U.S. to learn about retailing in America. He learned uh, uh, a bit by going to Macy's and Gimbel's and Wanamaker's and lots of other retail stores and my mother uh, joined him and they were traveling around the country and in 1939 my mother became pregnant with me and they decided at that point to go back to Holland. In the meantime, Hitler had taken over on the Eastern Front the countries what are now Czechoslovakia and Austria. And, um, they thought that notwithstanding that war had broken out in Europe and Hitler was uh, threatening much more, that they could go back to Holland because Holland was neutral during World War I. And during that time, um, 
the Dutch uh, were not attacked, and uh, everyone in Holland thought that they would not be attacked again. Indeed, Hitler, in September of 1939, uh, promised that the Dutch would not be attacked. And notwithstanding that, uh, on May uh, 10th, 1940, Hitler sent the Nazi troops to Holland. They bombarded the city of uh, Rotterdam to bits. Um, the Dutch were given two days or three days to surrender. Otherwise, they would uh, demolish the cities of Amsterdam and Utrecht. Um, the Dutch queen and her cabinet left on a um, a destroyer, uh, an English destroyer, set up government in London. The rest of the family went to Canada, and um, the Dutch uh, were taken over. Um, my parents had a chance at that point uh, to escape. Um, on the PowerPoint, there is a, uh, um, a passport of my father uh, appreciate that, uh, to jump the story a bit, uh, my father never uh, uh, had a country in which he became a citizen after he left uh, Germany. Uh, Germans uh, took away the passports and um, he never was able to acquire Dutch citizenship. Um, during the early years preceding the war and during the war, um, Germans coming to Holland, and there were many of them, were generally not allowed to acquire Dutch citizenship. At any rate, um, the Nazis took over uh, the city of uh, Rotterdam, and um, for a few days there was an opportunity to leave Holland and to seek um, shelter in England by acquiring a passage on um, fishing boats. At some of the fishing ports in Holland, if you came with coins, because money, cash, uh, paper money was worthless already, if you came with coins, gold and silver, you could buy passage on a, ship, on a fishing boat to England. And a few of my aunts and uncles and other relatives were able to do just that. Um, my parents came to um, a fishing port with my grandmother on my mother's side and myself as a baby. And they thought there would be ships. There were rumors that there would be big ships taking everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, the ports uh, were chaotic. Uh, there were no boats to speak of, and at that point, my grandmother had an earache, and I had a toothache, or vice versa, and my parents decided that we would go back to our apartment in Amsterdam and seek to escape on another day. Well, of course, the Germans soon closed the borders, and we never had a chance to escape. Um, as you may have heard, um, what happened is that there was a vicious anti-Semite appointed for the Netherlands. His name was Seis Inquart. And um, the difference between Holland and other countries like Belgium and France is that this was a civil government rather than a military government. The military governments were generally less severe than a government like that of Seis Inquart. What happened was uh, the first thing that um, Seis Inquart did, he commissioned a group to create a map of all the um, homes that had Jews, uh, which they did early in the war. Um, and then um, all the Jews had to come to Amsterdam. So suddenly in our apartment where we had uh, just my parents and myself, uh, we suddenly had uh, grandparents, a great-grandmother, uh, an uncle and aunt, 
uh, all living in our apartment. Um, but we were alive. And then there were other decrees that started coming, and you may have heard some of them already. Um, we could not go to public schools. We could not use public transportation. We could not shop in the regular public uh, stores. Uh, we could not um, use the parks. Uh, we could not have radios. We could not have any means of transportation, no bikes, no motorcycles, no um, cars. Um, and we were not allowed to use public transportation. But we were alive. Um, at a given moment, um, my mother's sister, uh, who was married to a founder of uh, the Dutch newspaper uh, at Parol, um, which was an underground resistance paper during the war. Uh, he was an editor of that, and the Germans were after him. So um, they, at a given moment, took his wife, my aunt, and their three children, and um, they put them in jail first uh, within the city of Amsterdam. And my grandmother, the, who was married to the diamond cutter uh, um, owner, um, was able to pay for their staying in Holland at least for a little while, but pretty soon they were shipped off. And at that point, my parents decided that they probably should consider going into hiding. My father got a call to go to the work camps in Germany um, on the same date that Margot Frank got the call. Uh, they were given a notice that they should report to the train station and um, that they should take with them all sorts of um, heavy clothing, um, eating utensils, um, boots, um, outerwear, uh, and be prepared to work. My parents were young. They thought they could, they could handle that. Um, so my father went to the train station. He saw that not only uh, healthy young people were going uh, in the transports, but invalids, older people, babies, and they were all pushed into cattle cars, and the cars were locked and shipped off. At that point, it was very clear that my parents had to do something. And they made that decision when my aunt was taken off and sent to the concentration camps, and he saw what was happening in the train stations. Uh, they made that decision that they had to go into hiding themselves, and they had to take care of me somehow. At that point, uh, this is now in um, toward March of 1943. Um, at that point, I was three and a half years old. Um, and uh, they made that decision to give me up to the resistance in Holland and to go into hiding themselves. For themselves, they had been able to find a hiding place in an attic on the Centurban, a major uh, street in Amsterdam. And there on a, in an attic um, without heat, without electricity, and with one window, uh, they were ultimately to spend, uh, as my book uh, relates, 396 days, um, 33 Seven. more, 397 days. 796 days, you're right. <laughs> Uh, it was first going to be 797, we counted, and my publisher said that that sounded too much like uh, an airplane, so uh, <laughs> we should make it 796 days. Um, but that's uh, about 30 more uh, uh, than Professor Laura uh, <laughs> quoted uh, earlier. Um, and those last 30 days were not that great. Um, at any rate, they made that decision that they would go into hiding. And they, for themselves, arranged this attic place in the Centurban with a couple 
who um, my mother had worked with when she was doing social work. Uh, the father was uh, incapacitated. Uh, they had two teenage daughters, um, and they had to pay for their hiding. So at that point, um, my father decided that if they were to go into hiding, he needed some money. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves, though, but no, that's all right. Leave it there. It's okay. Uh, no, that nice picture of that little kid. Actually, we should, uh, we should go back to that one. Uh, that was me. Uh, there he is. Uh, I don't know what happened, but at that point, uh, the kid was cute. Um, it was um, a difficult thing to contemplate going into hiding, and he knew he needed money. So um, my father had been, before he lost his job, as you heard, all Jews lost their jobs, basically. Uh, he was a rug buyer uh, in uh, the department store. And he made contacts with a um, Muslim uh, rug dealer. And he went to that rug dealer and he said to him, I need a bunch of rugs and I'll sell them on consignment, meaning that he would pay for them when he sold them. And the rug dealer indeed gave him a bunch of rugs and my father uh, ultimately um, did very well selling uh, those rugs uh, over a period of a couple of months, uh, selling them mostly to Germans who occupied uh, homes that previously belonged to Dutch Jews. And he um, went to the rug dealer and he said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I have a couple of rugs left over and here they are. And so, um, the rug dealer said to him, um, he said to him, take this rug with you. Uh, it is a Persian prayer rug. Um, and it's still in very good condition. And you'll see that the head can't have a picture of a person, but you could see where the head goes and the hands go. And the rug dealer said to my father, take this into hiding with you and Allah will save you. And my parents took it with them and we think maybe, maybe it was Allah who saved them. Um, this is a nice piece to show when I go to schools that have Muslim kids, because it's a nice thing to know that, uh, that they were heroes in World War II also. So, um, this rug was on my parents' uh, piano till the day they died, and it's now on our piano, and Laura, you'll have to wait till... Uh, <laughs> you have to get a piano. <laughs> Um, so, through the resistance, and the resistance contacts were through my mother's sorority sisters. Uh, one was Aleda Schott, uh, who was a, um, a well-known uh, professor of Slavic languages, ultimately. Um, <clears throat> they made the contact with the uh, resistance, primarily a minister, a minister in the city of Harlem, who uh, arranged placements for Jewish kids. Um, I was placed uh, initially with a young man um, who lived outside of Amsterdam, and he um, was recently married, and they agreed to take me. They didn't think that the war would last as long as it would last, and it didn't last very long because um, it destroyed their marriage uh, very quickly, probably because of me, and I was then given back to the resistance, which put me briefly into a sort of uh, orphanage in the north of Amsterdam, and my, um, the father of the young man, uh, I guess sort of liked me and 
on a bicycle. He got a permit to go through the German camp, uh, through the German lines, and pick me up in the orphanage and take me back to his apartment. Uh, that was Opa Schimmel, and uh, if we could find Opa in the the two Schimmels, uh, let me see. Okay, well, Opa and Oma Schimmel are there on the left. Um, he was a retired policeman, um, and they lived in uh, an apartment on the third floor of an apartment building, which uh, we also just had. Um, and that's where I spent uh, the war years. And here on the other photo, you see Oma Schimmel. That's Grandma Schimmel. I called them Oma and Opa. Um, and that's me. Um, I think this was taken right after the war, rather than during the war. Um, so I wound up with Opa and Oma Schimmel and their daughter, um, um, whom I teased mercilessly. She was 14 years older than I. Uh, her name was Tilly. And uh, I always thought it would be better if Tilly were the dead, then we would have more to eat. And that's what I told the Schimmels. Uh, it's just terrible, but you know, I was not a good kid, I guess. Um, <laughs> My parents uh, were in a much worse place. I never knew while I was in hiding whether uh, there was a war going on. Um, I never knowingly was hungry. Uh, I ate sugar beets and tulip bulbs and they tasted fine to me. Um, and I just didn't know better. Also, fortunately, Opa Schimmel had a we'll call it a girlfriend, uh, who worked in, uh, who was German and worked in a bar in Amsterdam and was able through that link to get some money here and there and also to get some food uh, through that link. At any rate, um, the worst part of the war was the hunger winter and the hunger winter took place at the end of 1944. Um, by then, uh, southern part of Holland had been liberated, but the northern part, including Amsterdam, uh, was still under German occupancy. Um, the Queen of Holland had decreed that there should be no further shipments to Germany because Germany was taking all of anything of value in Holland, including all the factories, anything made out of metal, etc., and that was shipped off to uh, Germany by the railroads, and the Queen decreed from London that there should be no more shipments. Uh, the Germans, uh, who always reacted very harshly to anything in support of the Jews, um, caused uh, the shipment of food to be stopped completely from Germany to Holland. And as a result of that, an estimated 60,000 people starved um, in Holland. Um, early on in the war, again, uh, this was as early as 1941, there was an action, a strike, started by the Dock Workers Union, a socialist union in Amsterdam, which arranged a strike in support of the Jews. It's the only strike in any country of Europe uh, that was in support of the Jews. The Nazis reacted extremely harshly to that. They took 450 leaders of the, um, of the strike, of the Union, and executed just about all of them. Um, also, there were executions of people who hid Jews. As you heard, there were uh, bounties paid uh, for people who betrayed Jews and discovered Jews in hiding. Uh, and that may have been what happened with Anne Frank. We don't really know anymore. Uh, but um, there certainly were gangs of people who tried to acquire uh, these bounties for betraying Jews and finding Jews in hiding. Um, on May 5th, 
1945, um, Amsterdam was finally liberated. And it was liberated by the Canadian Maple Leaf Brigade. So the Dutch people are extremely fond of the Canadians and they celebrate uh, the liberation of uh, Holland and um, on two, basically two days, May 4th and 5th. And the Canadians who were involved are always invited at Dutch expense to participate in a parade on that day. Of course, there are not very many in that parade anymore. Um, but there's always been a weak spot, in, especially in Amsterdam, for the Canadians. So the end of the war was there. It was May 5th, 1945. And um, everybody was outside celebrating with anything that was made of orange. You put in orange um, pennants, you put on orange shirts, anything made of orange um, people would have. And I wanted desperately to have an orange hat and I made the shimmel stand in line until I got a, a, an orange hat. Why, do you know why um, uh, orange uh, was so important? Does anybody know? House of Orange. Yes, that's the answer, the House of Orange. That's Oranje Boven. Uh, it's basically, if you see the Dutch teams in the Olympics or elsewhere, they're wearing orange. Um, there's always an orange banner above the Dutch flag. Uh, the House of Orange has been historically very beloved, and the current king uh, has been very um, open uh, for his support of the stories about the Jews. Um, his grandmother um, was not uh, a great supporter of the Jews, and there have been stories about that, and there was a presentation about that by uh, Julie Marth Cohen uh, at the museum a little while ago. Um, my war parents knew at that point that my real parents would probably come to find me. And within the next day or two, my father and mother uh, came to our house, my father to our apartment. They had learned where I was, they didn't know beforehand, through the resistance. And they came to our house, uh, our apartment, and they rang the bell, and my war mother knew that they would be coming, I did not. And suddenly, this couple appeared. They were horrendous looking. I mean, they were emaciated beyond belief. My father had feet like this because he had not walked in years. Um, they looked awful. And suddenly, these people, whom I did not remember, nor did I recognize them, um, they suddenly said they were my parents. That was difficult for all of us. It was difficult for me, I'm sure. But it was also, of course, very difficult for my war parents who came to love me, believe it or not, um, and um, for my real parents who had to wean me away in some manner. To the credit of the Schimmels, they did not require uh, that I ultimately become adopted. They did not require that I adopt their religion, because uh, Oma Schimmel especially was a uh, Dutch Reformed church and very religious. Um, and they always viewed themselves as caretakers. And that's the role that they played. And over a period of several days and probably weeks, um, I was weaned away to my war parents. Uh, um, from my war parents to my real parents. My real parents, that first day, took me to their hiding place. And there, though they were subject to absolute uh, starvation, they saved for me a can of baked beans, which they hid under the floorboard. And they would not touch it, even though they were so hungry they were desperate. Um, but they did not touch that can of beans. And so I came there. And uh, with great ceremony, they opened the can of beans and offered it to me. And my reaction was, Ugh! 
I hate baked beans. And so they'd saved it all this time for that reaction. It's really sort of sad. At any rate, um, they stayed, as you may have heard, they stayed in my life. My war father died in 1951, uh, reportedly, though his family denies it in the bed of a girlfriend. Uh, my war mother lived until uh, the 80s, and I used to go to Holland while practicing law uh, probably 10 times a year, and always visited Oma. And I always asked her, or often asked her, why did she do this? And her answer very simply was always, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to give her something, and I asked her, is there anything you would want? And she said, I would like a pocketbook. And so I uh, jumped in my car. I went to the Pese Hofstraat, which has the best stores in Amsterdam. And I bought a pocketbook, a Gucci Pucci, the best that I could find. <laughs> and I went back to Oma Schimmel. And uh, she stroked it, but she was never able to use it. Um, my father got his job back. Uh, we got a house, um, and we even got a little car, a standard, if anybody's into old English cars. Um, and um, life was, you would think, would be pretty good, um, but all their friends had been gone, murdered, a lot of houses where they lived in the Jewish part of Amsterdam. Um, they were all gone. And the economy of Holland was in the pits, as you can imagine, after the war. Uh, so the future looked dim, and my father decided uh, that we had to go to America. And so we did. We came on the Westerdam, a boat of the Holland America Line, and it was a converted uh, Liberty ship. And we arrived uh, in New York. It was misty and you could see, though, the Statue of Liberty. And my mother uh, made a statement that will live forever, which was, here we are in America with our family, and we beat Hitler. Uh, that was a creed for my mother for most of her life. And she'd be very pleased now uh, to know that uh, we have uh, four children, uh, nine grandchildren, and uh, none of them would be there without uh, the Schimmels and the Hochbaums. Um, my first days in Port Washington, you heard a little bit. Um, I went to um, a uh, private school across the street from a house that my grandmother had bought for us. My grandmother was able to go, this is the grandmother from the diamond business, was able to go to Holland, uh, to New York, because they had been able to send some money abroad beforehand. And she ultimately got a very nice apartment on a residential hotel on 86th and 5th. Um, she bought us a house in Port Washington. My aunt, who had escaped on those first days of the war, landed in Port Washington. And so we were destined to be there with with my aunt and her family. Um, we have lived in Port Washington ever since. Um, I met my wife in seventh grade in Port Washington. We've been married some almost 63 years. Um, our kids have grown up in Port Washington and several still live there. Um, so that was very important to us. I didn't speak a word of English so my mother took me to the principal at the local school and said, you know, my son doesn't speak a word of English. What is going to happen to him? And uh, the principal, Miss Merriman, very severe, large woman, <laughs> said, uh, and this was before Essel and Tessel. They, we didn't have those things in 1947. Um, she said, uh, for the first few days, the other kids will beat him up, but after that, it'll be okay. <laughs> and I think that's what, what happened. Um, 
I'd like to end the story there, if that's okay with you all. Um, I would like to make one small caveat, and it was brought up briefly, um, and that is the Anne Frank story. Um, Anne Frank was not a Dutch woman. She was a German uh, woman who came to Holland at a young age. Her parents were German or Austrian slash German. Um, they um, lived in a part of Amsterdam um, where there were many German refugees. Um, as I mentioned early on, everyone knew uh, that the uh, business of uh, Otto Frank uh, was a Jewish business uh, on uh, uh, one of the canals. And they also knew where the Jews lived. Um, and that was known at all times. The Dutch civil service was so organized, they knew where every Jew lived. So part of the problem with Anne Frank is that people knew that there was something going on in that back, back uh, factory uh, part of the uh, building on the Prinzengracht. Uh, also, uh, they had to be fed, so food had to come in there, other things, other provisions had to come in there, and that did not really uh, work. Um, so too many people knew, and they were doomed. They were just plain doomed. Um, fortunately, of course, Mipchis uh, kept the pages of the diary and the diary became tremendously important and still is. Um, amazing young woman. Um, at one point, and this is just a sideline and then I'll stop. I could talk a lot, as you may <laughs> gather. Um, at one point, I had five pages of the diary that had never seen the light of day. What happened was that the Dutch um, financial director of the Anne Frank House. Um, his name, um, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, he was the Dutch director of the finances for the house. He was very close to Otto Frank. Otto Frank in um, early 50s moved to Basel and remarried. And um, at that point, uh, the rights to the diary were basically transferred to the Anne Frank Fonts, a foundation in Switzerland. So the Dutch house basically only has the actual copy of the diary, but no rights to exploit it. Um, and this man, his name was Korsak. And Korsak uh, came to me when I was the director of the Anne Frank uh, Fund in, in Anne Frank uh, um, Foundation in New York City. Uh, he came to me and asked for a job, and I gave him a job to be our international uh, director. And he went frequently to visit Otto Frank. And one day, uh, Korsak came to me with an envelope with five pages of the diary written in hand by Anne Frank. And he, I read them, of course. He said these were pages which Otto Frank did not want to have uh, see the light of day. And uh, they included uh, comments by Anne Frank about her parents and about her becoming a woman. And um, those pages are very important, and I, uh, in law school, nobody told me what to do if somebody gives you five pages of the Anne Frank uh, diary. <laughs> uh, I went to the Morgan uh, Library and um, asked about them, and they said they had very considerable value. And I offered them to the Dutch government, and they didn't want it. I offered it first to the Anne Frank House in Holland. They didn't want it. They thought that Korsak had stolen them they didn't believe they were real, and they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, so then I was going to uh, arrange to auction it, and some Russian oligarch might have bought them. And um, the, uh, uh, the Dutch government uh, 
came through at the very last moment, the Dutch Treasury Department came through at the very last moment and bought those five pages. They were subsequently authenticated. They are in the book if you buy the diary, and it dates from any date after 2003. Uh, it will have those five pages. But for a while, that was sort of uh, hairy. Um, but I'll, I'll end with that. I do want to stress that the Anne Frank story is very different from our story. We survived because we had a support system. Going back to the sorority and the resistance and my parents, friends, and, and relationships, we had a support system. And Anne Frank was a, uh, an immigrant and uh, viewed as such. And uh, it was very different. They didn't have that. I'd like to end on that. I thank you all very much for your attention. Schwartz. I'm Leo's oldest daughter. I've been asked to moderate a question and answer. But I just had one quick thing to say first. Since we are here for hero hero heroism and remembrance, um, my dad alluded it to it, but between the Schimmels and the Hochenbaums, they are responsible for 19 descendants living today. And that's really why we're here. Um, and I wanted my dad, I've heard so many stories over the years. And one thing, again, on the theme of heroism that we don't think about, we think about our own personal stories, and we don't think about the struggles that these people, the Schimmels, the Hokumbums, must have been going through. Can you relate the postman story, just because be recognizing you on the street, because how that must have felt to the Schimmels. Right. Um, I don't know if it was a postman or the milkman, but suddenly he said, oh, uh, hello, Yochi. Uh, so he knew who I was from um, where I used to live. And that's the only inkling that my war parents had where I came from. Um, but. It wasn't much more. Laura, I, I thought you were going to ask about Oma's teeth. <laughs> no, I'll ask you, what about oh, Oma's teeth? Oh, thank you. <laughs> what about <laughs> Oma's teeth? Um, my mother, in hiding, suddenly had a toothache that was so awful. It was totally debilitating. She just couldn't live with it. And she decided that she had to leave their hiding place and do something about her teeth. She knew that there was a particular street in Amsterdam, de la Ressestraat, where there were dentists. And uh, she went to a dentist's uh, door, knocked on the door, told him that she had this terrible pain in her, in her tooth, and would, she, would he uh, help her. Uh, she didn't have any money, she couldn't pay him, and she couldn't tell him who she was. He said he would help her. There was no electricity in Amsterdam at that point, so all there was was an old gadget like the Singer sewing machine where you press on a, a pedal of some sort, and that turned the drill. Um, so he drilled uh, her and uh, put in some stitches, and he told her to come back on another day. Well, it was very dangerous for my mother to go out, but as a woman going on in dusk, um, she would be okay. Uh, if it was a man, they would take him immediately for a service, Jewish or non-Jewish. Um, but for a woman, she, she was going to be, she had a chance. And she came back for the second time, um, and he took out the stitches, and he gave her a loaf of bread. I mean, a loaf of bread at that point was just worth anything and which she took back to her hiding place, and they, they kept that. Um, as I mentioned, my father never did get out. 
Um, so with that, does anybody have any questions? Oh, do you want to introduce yeah. me? Um, <laughs> I just want to give a proper introduction. Um, Laura Schwartz, who is Leo Ullman's oldest daughter, has had the unique experience of growing up as a first-generation American on her father's side and a descendant of the Mayflower Pilgrims on her mother's side. While, while these backgrounds may seem very different, the experience was the same, trying to survive and have a better life amid religious persecution. Laura cannot remember a time when she was not aware of the Holocaust and the disruption it caused in the lives of her immediate and extended family. She currently lives and works in Manhattan together with her husband and has two adult sons. She has always listened to and read with great interest Holocaust stories and she's looked at, at Laura is a graduate of the University of Michigan and holds an MBA from the NYU Graduate School of Business. She's also a certified financial analyst with a career in investment banking and is currently a managing director of Seaport Global Securities, LLC. And thank you so much for moderating the question and answer for us tonight. We have time for just a few questions, and I will let um, Ms. Schwartz um, side anyone you know, that open this to sure, the audience. Yeah. You said after the war that your father got a house and a car. That wasn't exactly clear how he got them. With, with the money that uh, the um, his employer uh, uh, had saved up, and uh, that was that was there. And my mother had a little bit of money at that point. Um, I should add to that. Uh, then, when we came to the U.S., uh, they still had some money, and he invested it immediately in a textile business in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and lost it all within a year. <laughs> Anyway. The money from the employer, though, that was probably required, right, under reparations. Yes. Right, yes. that was required under reparations. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How many more stories do you like you that were How many? Oh, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was how many more stories are there like yours of children surviving and hidden? Um, quite a few, in fact. Uh, it's estimated that there were 12,000 uh, Jews in hiding who survived, um, of whom um, probably 2,000 are still alive. Um, one is Jeanette Ringgold, for example, who is a daughter of a cousin of my parents, and she's been active. Um, and um, there are others. I've I've heard others. Um, and and you're starting at you know as as this population is aging, over the last twenty years, you've seen a large number of self-published books and people's personal stories. Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious to know if you ever reconnected with the Muslim. Um, no, popular? it's a it's a good question. We have tried and lost that, that contact completely. Uh, it's sad because it's a, it's so a critical it's part of our survival in a way. Uh, no, we, we lost that. <laughs> Any other questions? Another heroine, Hannah Senesh, uh, based off the poem Eli Eli. And will you say a few words? Thank you.
This is a melody that was inspired by a poem known as A Walk to Caesarea by the poet, playwright, and warrior Hanna Senesh, who was born in Hungary and at age 18 in 1939 made Aliyah and she attended an agricultural school and she joined the Haganah. And she was later assigned by the British mandate to a special parachute mission to Yugoslavia um, to join the resistance and rescue Jews in Hungary. And on this mission she was captured and she was tried in Hungary for treason and later executed. This poem was composed in 1942 when she was living on a kibbutz, Sedot Yam, which was a short ways away from the beaches of Caesarea. And the English translation is, Oh God, my Lord, I pray that these things never end. The sand and the sea, the rush of the water, the lightning of the heavens, and the prayer of the heart. It was set to music in 1945 by the beloved Israeli composer David Zahavi. I invite you to sing along if you know it. Melody recalling the heroism of 23 year old Hannah Senesh, executed for risking her life 
to parachute back into Hungary. And in many ways, her heroism for me is echoed in what I found to be one of the most emotional parts of Leo's talk, um, and, in his, and, and before this in his story, which is the moment when his mother says, we beat Hitler. Um, it makes me think of how hard it must have been for her to separate from him as a mother and make the decision to hide separately for, I think you said 797, is that right, days? Um, I think it's just one of the many things that is unimaginable in terms of the horror and the brutality of the Nazis. Um, we thank Leo Ullman and his family for sharing with us tonight these stories of heroism, of his non-Jewish rescuers, and of his family, and of himself, before, during, and after the war. The mission of the Wagner College Holocaust Center is to empower future generations in empathy, courage, and ethical decision-making in order to combat anti-Semitism, racism, and prejudice in all its forms. And from your reference to the Muslim rug dealer um, and the interfaith aspects of this program um, and all the different components of the story that you have brought out of the women who helped your mother, helped get her into the resistance networks, um, there is so much that we share. This year, we had the theme of our annual, sixth annual Holocaust art contest. Um, the deadline was actually today we've gotten 100, 100, about 100, uh, many different schools have participated. The theme was, why did ordinary people risk their lives to help others? And it was inspired by your story. Um, we are so grateful to have a kid, found a kindred spirit in the Ullman family. And I just have to add one thing about the color orange. Um, as I think I've mentioned to you, I'm also deeply fascinated by the connection through the Dutch founding of Staten Island. And as many of you may know, Staten Island was named for the Dutch parliament um, in, I think it was six, in the 1600s. Um, and there's something to all of this. And we're figuring out what, what it is. Um, I want to thank the Chai Society and everyone who is here for your ongoing support. We have a lot of big ambitions and dreams. The opening of the gallery, the Holocaust Action and Education Gallery is just a first step. We need to bring students there. We need to take our message out into the community, out into the world, through partnerships with universities around the country and around the world to bring out this me message of empathy and how ordinary people can be heroes and upstanders. And to, say, to sort of end with that, let me just conclude by quoting the words of Meep Gies, the rescuer of Anne Frank, and herself, somebody who is celebrated for her humanity. Born in Vienna, Niep came to the Netherlands when she was 11 years old. This displacement and feeling of being an outsider may have contributed to her empathy for the Frank family. Shortly before she died in 2010, at the age of 100, she said these words, no one should ever think you have to be special to help others. Even an ordinary secretary or a housewife or a teenager can turn on a small light in a dark room. And so in honor of the six million lights that were extinguished, let us all be a light to each other. Thank you. Thank you.